Good morning, everyone. And welcome. Glad you are here today, this almost spring morning. <laughs> um, today, our focus is going to be on our current object stories exhibit, which is called Invisible Me. Um, Betsy is going to tell us a little bit more about object stories because I'm thinking it's been a while since we've had a program that had to do with object stories. And I have to tell you, just to refresh my memory, I went online, for those of you who are computer people, and called up the Portland, Op Portland Art Museum object stories. And they had a link there to YouTube which I clicked on, and there were the object stories. They're only two to four minutes um, long, and very, very touching, very interesting. So uh, you will enjoy it, I'm sure. Our current object stories exhibit is called Invisible Me, and we have Dr. Lil Linda Williams today with us. Uh, she's going to speak after Betsy. Betsy will tell you a little bit more about her. But she founded a project um, called the Invisible Disabilities Project. I think probably many of us in this room are touched by an invisible disability, if not our own, a family member or a good friend. It's all around us, so the more we can know and understand, the more we can challenge our perceptions and think about change and promote understanding, the better. So let's get going, and we're going to hear first from Betsy Knopp, who is our uh, public programs person from the uh, education department. Let's welcome Betsy. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you Judy for the introduction. Um, originally Kristen Bayens, our manager of interpretive media here at the museum, who among other things uh, runs our object stories exhibition series. She was going to speak to you today about the exhibition, um, however she had a family emergency and isn't able to be here, so I'm presenting um, her material on her behalf. Uh, how many of you were here last year in March for our last Object Stories presentation? A few people? Yeah, so it'll, it's familiar to some. Um, and how many of you are familiar with the Object Stories exhibition series that's just outside of this room? Great, great. So new for some, familiar for others. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Object Stories is as an exhibition concept and then speak a little bit more specifically about what the current exhibition is. Um, so Object Stories is a personal storytelling project and exhibition series that was launched here at the museum in 2010, and it's gone through a few chapters. Uh, it was originally conceived as a way to interrupt, interrupt the traditional authoritative voice of the museum and encourage visitors to make and share personal connections to works of art. And that's really an ethic um, at this museum. As many of you who are regulars to this program know, we not only um, invite curators to the podium for this program, but we also uh, invite artists and also community members who are thinking about the big ideas within works of art and exhibitions that we host here at the museum. Uh, more recently, the Object Stories exhibition has evolved to become a platform where Portland and the Pacific Northwest's many communities can directly address issues affecting their lives. True to its origins, Object Stories today helps drive the Portland Art Museum to become a safe and responsive space open for dialogue, conversation, and the exchange of ideas. And I want to clarify that we aren't always a safe space, but that's what we strive for. And it takes all of us as a community to make this place a safe space for everybody. Um, and just as a reminder, um, you're, after the program, you're welcome to go into the galleries. You're also welcome to leave and go get lunch or coffee and come back to the museum. Um, and I invite you to take some time in the gallery, in the Object Stories Gallery, just outside of the space um, today and always. 
So how does an exhibition come together in that space? Well, um, every year we host two thematic object stories exhibitions that are accompanied by multi-sensory activities and calls to action. For each exhibition, five to six community members come together in a day-long storytelling workshop to learn about the craft of storytelling. And they're also invited to collaborate the museum on the many aspects of the exhibition. So thinking about what the big idea is, um, creating exhibition texts, thinking about what interactives will be in the gallery space, and also thinking about what programming can accompany the exhibition. You will notice that each story can be listened to on a digital tablet in the galleries, uh, and they can also be found on the museum's website and YouTube channel, as Judy mentioned in her introduction. The stories are recorded and edited by the museum and distributed with the storyteller's final approval. So before we make the stories public, we share them with the storytellers and get their approval, which is very important. So the current exhibition, uh, Invisible Me, draws our attention beyond what we immediately notice about a person. Each of the storytellers in the exhibition, Justin Allen, Holly Oberg, Sarah McDermott, Micah Reed, and Greg B share an account of how they came to terms with very personal conditions and figured out how to move forward. Invisible disability, as we'll unpack more um, with Dr. Linda Williams' help, um, it's an umbrella term for a wide range of chronic physical, cognitive, and neurological conditions um, that cause a person to struggle in daily activities that um, some of us who may be more able-bodied um, might not struggle with, and there's a wide range um, within that. Because symptoms of these conditions are not often observed, those with invisible di disabilities are e easily judged, dismissed, uh, or left feeling unvalidated. And those living with in invisible disabilities are forced to weigh the risk of repercussions if they choose to outwardly identify. So for example, um, you know, at your workplace, if, you're, if your workplace isn't open, um, to speaking personally, um, uh, sometimes uh, projects can be withheld from a person. Um, that's not uncommon. Um, some are able to be open with their condition, uh, whereas others uh, choose to walk in its shadows and others choose to volley somewhere in between, right? We all move through many different spaces in our lives and have many different relationships um, where we can be more open about our, our full identities and our full selves, um, whereas in others we, we might choose not to be as open. Um, so yes, I definitely encourage you to spend some time in the exhibition and spend some time listening to the stories. They are short, but they are incredibly powerful and they express um, a range of perspectives and they're not instructive, they're, they're um, very intimate. Um, and we also have an interactive response wall, which you'll see, uh, which encourages visitors to share um, their experiences with invisible disabilities. And you'll notice um, people are responding on post-it notes, and they're sharing very, very, very intimate details about um, their own lives and people in their lives, and others are responding to those comments. Um, and it's a pretty incredible thing to have in a large public institution like the Portland Art Museum. So I take you, I encourage you to take some time with that space as well. Um, before I introduce Linda, um, on behalf of Kristen Baines, I wanted to thank the storytellers for being willing to share their stories and show their full selves, which means sharing parts of themselves that are incredibly vulnerable and not often shown publicly. I also wanted um, to thank, on behalf of Kristen, the documentary filmmaker Cheryl Green, whose work focuses on d disability identity and culture and on making media accessible. And Cheryl Green is a um, Portland-based documentary filmmaker who will be screening a film, um, I believe, on April 24th in this space. Uh, and also Paul Irabino of True Path Consulting, whose work uses storytelling principles to bring people together, inspire audiences, and stimulate personal reflection. Paul is integral um, in leading the day-long storytelling workshop. Uh, so I um, am going to introduce Linda, and before I do, I just wanna say I'm so um, deeply grateful uh, to her for taking the time to be here with us. 
um, I think you'll enjoy and learn a lot from her presentation. I know I have, um, and I did yesterday when she presented to our docent council. So, Dr. Linda Williams is a visiting scholar at the University of San Diego School of Leadership and Education Sciences. Her research focuses on leadership, better inclusion practices, and discovering paths to equity for disabled students and adults. She is also a licensed clinical psychologist who combined lived experiences and disability activism with a social vision to found the Invisible Disability Project, as Linda mentioned in the, um, or Judy, pardon me, mentioned in the introduction. The Invisible Disability Project is a social cultural movement and an educational media project that consciously disrupts invisibility imposed upon invisible disabilities at the intersection of race, class, gender, and sexuality. Specifically, Invisible Disability Project envisions a world where people with invisible disabilities no longer encounter barriers to equitable public education, competitive employment, healthcare, personal relationships, technology, media representation, laws, and policy. Please help me in welcoming Linda Williams to the stage. Hello. <laughs> you guys all look so content and happy. <laughs> I saw the sun shining this morning in Portland. Um, I'm so excited to be here. And I just, um, here, I'm just going to turn this off first. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and really, what an honor. And thank you so much uh, to Betsy and uh, Kristen, who unfortunately isn't here, and also to Cheryl Green for just welcoming me and recommending that I come and speak about invisible disabilities. So I wanted to say that first. Um, I'd like to do this day in two parts. I would like to start by telling my story about having an invisible disability, and then I'll move back to the podium and we can have a more traditional lecture. Um, but I, I'd like to start by just sitting over here. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So the way that Betsy introduced me is so lovely. But those are just roles that I occupy. I occupy the role of a visiting scholar, a clinical psychologist, and founder of a disability organization. I'm also a mother and a daughter <clears throat> and a sister. Excuse me. <clears throat> Is this Murphy? <clears throat> Excuse me. A, a mother and a daughter and a sister. These are parts of my identity. But the identity that I want to connect with and have you connect with me on is my identity as a person who's disabled. I have a retina disease that impacts the way that I see. Every morning when I wake up, I know that my retina doesn't work like everyone else's. And it turns out that seeing and seeing well is pretty important. I am losing vision in my peripheral areas. And sometimes straight lines look wavy. And I'm recently colorblind. And I would have never considered myself disabled. Uh, but my low vision, my visual impairment, started bumping up against the social environment. And what that means is when a group of my friends invites me out to Joshua Tree, and they say, we're driving at nighttime. And I know I can't drive at night. Or when I'm sitting in a restaurant at night, and I see the little tiny writing in the menu, uh, and I decide to just order what they're ordering because I'm too 
ashamed to have to ask for help to read a menu or to drive. Uh, or when I go to the movie theater and I can't read the captions, I know that I have a disability because my visual impairment is interacting with a social world that doesn't accept my bodily diversity. But I didn't take in or identify as disabled until I had a son, an amazing, intelligent, beautiful, incredibly wise son who is also on the autism spectrum. And when I walked through his disability journey in school, I realized that using the word disabled was not something to be ashamed of. It, in fact, aptly describes my experience in the social world. And it very accurately described my son's experience, which I'd like to describe to you. In doing so, I think it's important to say that another one of my roles is that I'm a single mother and proud, a single parent by choice. And so when I get a call from a school principal, you know what that's like. You're looking at your phone all day, and, you, and that phone call comes in. And one day, I was in my office, and my phone rang. And it was the school principal, and he said that I needed to pick up my son. So being the single earner, that meant that I had to cancel all my patients for the day and get in the car and go to school. He didn't tell me much except he wasn't harmed, and you know, he was OK. So I canceled my day, and I arrived at school. And I walked into the principal's office. And there I saw my second grader in a corner with a beet red face and tears streaming down his face, and a stern-looking principal standing over a table with a paper, with boilerplate language. And with his two fingers, he just pushed it over in front of me and just kind of pointed. And I looked down and I noticed, wow, these are really bad behaviors being described in this boilerplate document. And then I stopped on the box that was checked. And it said, violence toward an adult staff member. And I. I mean, I was just stunned. There was no qualitative information. It was just a box checked. And then they described to me, well, my son described to me what happened. You see, having a disability as a student means that we are afforded uh, the protection of being able to access a free and appropriate public education. And what that means is that we get to have an IEP which stands for Individualized Education Plan. Part of his Individualized Education Plan is that he has the benefit of being pulled out for different therapies in school. On this particular day, he was going to a turn-taking therapy. Because you know, it's important to learn how to take turns uh, with his school psychologist. And so they had a die. and. She would roll the die and move a piece around, and then it was his turn, and he would take the die. And when it was a psychologist's turn again, she went to go grab the die from his hand, and he said, no, it's mine, right? That's the purpose of why they were there. So she grabbed and started to pry open his hand to take the die. And my son, with his little second grade hand, slapped the top of her hand and said, no. That psychologist took my son to the principal's office and said, this student hit me. That was the reason the box that said violence toward an adult staff member was checked. Um, 
The punishment? Suspended for a day. I thought, okay, this isn't really going to benefit my son because he's none the wiser. He was confused and bewildered why he was even being singled out. But I took him home <clears throat> and was pretty upset. About a month later, a very similar situation happened. Again, I get the phone call. This time, it was on a Wednesday. I went to go pick him up again, and there was that boilerplate looking document, very scary legal document. This time, there was a different box checked, and it said, destruction of school property. In my mind, and I don't know about you, but when I think destruction of school property, the first thing, a chair thrown through a building window, maybe a fire in the garbage can in the bathroom, or graffiti on the wall. But there was no qualitative data, just that box. And this time I said, well, what happened? And he said, he broke his pencil and crumpled his homework. The punishment, three days suspension. Because it was the second infraction. And at this point, I was completely just blown away. I said, did you know that he has an IEP and is part of a protected class? He said, it doesn't matter. We have a zero tolerance policy against violence and against destruction of school property. Talk about interrupting authority. So I took my son back home and I told him that these were going to be the best three days of his life. But during that time, my head snapped off. Literally, I was, it was spinning, it was in another orbit somewhere. I thought, how could he be so betrayed by his special education team and by a system that's supposed to be in place to protect him? I didn't get it. I called special education lawyers, I called civil rights lawyers, and they said, yeah, you probably have a pretty decent case. You may or you may not prevail. It'll probably cost you about $100,000. And then I thought to myself, I'm going to be that parent and will be that family, muscling for rank in a system that will always be unyielding to diverse bodies and diverse minds, solid, unbendable structures and zero tolerance policies. And I also realized I'm a white woman with privilege and a great education. I don't experience poverty. And we live in a district that's wealthy and white. And I thought, if this is happening to my son, imagine what's happening when intersectional identities come into play. Kids of color who have boxes checked with no qualitative data. And their cumulative record says they're violent and they destroy property. Sound like the school to prison pipeline to me. It was in that moment that I decided I had to do something about this. I didn't want to spend $100,000 on lawyers and a fighting with system to system. I wasn't going to solve anything. I decided to quit my job. And I started the Invisible Disability Project. <laughs> because 
we've got to do something about this. Kids who have invisible disabilities, people who have invisible disabilities, need voice and agency and need to escape the tyranny of the box. So I put a stake in the ground and <laughs> worked with different scholars and decided I was going to learn as much as I could about what our cultural ideas and notions are about disability, where the barriers are, and then I was going to focus on how to solve it. it turned out that it's not so trivial. But now, three years later, we have an amazing growing organization with programs and some research and storytelling platform and 125 members, 125,000 members on our Facebook page. If that doesn't say there's a need. So, yeah, I am now claiming proudly an identity of disabled because by claiming a word that's erased and marginalized and silenced, by taking it and owning it proudly, it means that we're creating space and agency for others to claim and be proud of what it means to have a disability. And we, when we do that, we disrupt silence. And good things happen when we're able to disrupt silence and stop the erasure of diverse bodies in our society. So that's my Invisible Me story. And thank you for letting me share with you. And now I'm going to go give a lecture. <laughs> Okay. Are we all doing okay? All right. So the presentation today is Invisible Disabilities, Disrupting the Silence Around What It Means to Be Invisible. And I gave my story. The first thing that I, I want to do, that I do, I mention every time I speak, is that we have to acknowledge intersectional identities. Can I just see a show of hands of who has heard the word or understands intersectionality? A few people. Intersectionality means, like I said in the beginning, is that we all have different identities. Whether we're black, white, yellow, rich, poor, gay, straight, trans, bisexual, whether we're urban or rural, rich or poor, these are identities that belong to us. And they're meaningful in the social world. And often these identities overlap. And you can see how a person can become multiply marginalized when marginalized identities intersect. When we consider invisible disabilities, we have to always consider the intersectional identities. And this presentation, it's important to understand, is coming from the point of view of a white woman. But I always keep in the back of my mind, and in the front of my mind, actually, the fact that what I'm saying will mean something different to different people. And I think it's important that that you consider intersectional identities as well as we move through today. The other thing I'd like for you to consider today is the part about you that might be hidden, unseen, or invisible, and what that means to you. Okay. Here's what I want to get through today in our time together. It's ambitious, I know, but we can do it. 
I want to define invisible disabilities by deconstructing the use of the word invisible. And I want to do it in very two, two distinct ways. I want to situate invisible disability in the broader context of what's known as the medical model and the social model of disability. And then I'd like to trace the notable historical moments in disability civil rights and the disabled body in American society. This history of disability civil rights and the treatment of the disabled body historically has really shaped the current disability circumstances. And you'll, I, hope, I hope that becomes clear later on. So let's start by deconstructing the word invisible two ways. Invisible is an adjective. And this is how it's typically used. It's used to describe the word disability. Unseen, hidden, non-apparent, with regard to a disability. But I think it's important as change makers, people who want to be part of disrupting silence and erasure, to understand invisible as it relates to the noun invisible. It's a state of being. We don't really think of invisible disabilities in this way. I mean, after all, it's not like we're bending lights and wearing invisibility cloaks. It's that we have disabilities that observers are not able to see. But as you saw from my story and my son's experience, there is an invisible experience and state of being within our social structures. So this framing, I think, is very helpful. We're going to look now at invisible disabilities as it's described. Chronic pain, PTSD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, chronic fatigue, brain injury, autism spectrum, physical manifestations, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia. Can I see a show of hands of if you or someone you know has experienced one of these? Okay. If you didn't look around the room, I'll let you know what was going on. Almost everybody raised their hand. What that means is disability and invisible disabilities specifically are not exotic. They're part of our everyday experience. They're part of the human experience. But in our society, we tend to engage with disability through two different models, and one model in particular the medical model, which is the most common way of describing uh, a disability, looks at the disability as an artifact of the human. It looks at the disability as something to treat, to cure, to intervene. It's, it's it has to do with the person. The late Tobin Siebers, described the medical model of disability as it defines a disability as a property of the individual body. Nothing more, the property of the individual body. But now, I'd like to show you a set of empowered voices that describe, in their own words, the lived experience of not just having a disability as a property of their body, but as an experience also in the social world.
we're conditioned to see the physical attributes of somebody who's disabled. And yet we're forgetting that the brain is a very important part of a disability, of any disability. My name is Laura. I live with an acquired brain injury, PTSD and anxiety. I have lupus and this is me. To me, what's abnormal is trying to be something you're not. To me, being, ab you know, being abnormal is judging others because they're not your expectation of what life should be. And all I begin to see now is that all that judgment is is a lack of understanding, a lack of realization that life is bigger than yourself. That someone could be dealing with something that I could look like a healthy, normal person, and I'm bleeding right now. I'm Noah, I'm 22, I have Crohn's disease, and this is me. It's not about being afraid to admit a weakness. I'm, I'm fine with that. It's about saying, my body is not what I thought it would be. My name is Gabi, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and this is me. Sometimes I do feel the need to pass as normal. There's a lot of lack of education still about this topic, so sometimes I just pretend to be normal in order to avoid different situations that I don't feel comfortable about getting into. My name is Haley Zilberberg. I have chronic migraines, fibromyalgia, and this is me. I no longer want to live in shame of having lupus. Uh, I no longer want to live in shame with anything associated with me having a disease. I no longer will be invisible because without sharing my story or without lending a voice or without being available to some man, some child, some person that may be able to identify with me, then I'm purposefully putting myself in that invisibility box. Uh, it was only today. It's just been a very interesting day. There's a wide range of emotions because of reflection and projection. But um, my name is Terrell Rackley, and I'm a lupus patient. Lupus warrior, lupus survivor. I'm just Terrell Rackley, and I'm no longer invisible. And this is me. 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 We can see by the empowered voice that has given space, that is sort of emancipated from the box, shall we say, that they can, <clears throat> excuse me, own their identity and feel the freedom of just being a whole human. The social model of disability acknowledges the whole human. The social model of disability says <clears throat> that it's the structures in our society that create the disability, that we can have physical impairments or pathology in our body. But if the structures bend and yield to bodily or neurodiversity, where's the disability? That's the question. Tom Shakespeare, who's a professor of sociology and writes a lot about disability, he's from Great Britain, says this, 
The socially imposed barriers, the inaccessible buildings, the limited modes of transportation and communication, the prejudicial attitudes that construct the disability as a subordinate social state and a devalued life experience. That's profound. The social model of disability emancipates the human into a whole human, not just an artifact of a pathology or an impairment, but a human that has rights in this society to go where all others go, non-disabled people go. But the question that we have to consider and ask is, how did we get like this? How did two very separate, distinct models of disability even happen? Well, kind of like this. It always starts with the Greeks, that's what they say. So I was explaining to Betsy that this is bold of me as a clinical neuropsychologist describing a work of art, but I'm going to do my best. This is a work of art by Francois Vincent, circa 1791. And it depicts the painter, the fifth century Greek painter, Zeusis, choosing the most beautiful women of Croton to paint the ideal, to paint Helen. And so, while it's a lovely painting, we know what's really going on in this painting. He's saying, you, over there, with the beautiful elbow, I'll take you. You over there with the gorgeous blue eyes, come, come hither. You over there with the lovely legs. And so what he does <clears throat> is he deconstructs a whole human and creates parts, ideal parts, to then create the composite whole, which is a complete fantasy, which is an ideal the ideal body. This mindset is very much alive in our contemporary society as it relates to beauty, but also as it relates to diverse bodies. We are diverse humans, and we are far from perfect. And we're still fighting to be recognized as whole humans. Disability civil rights was a major milestone for the disabled community. The 1964 Civil Rights Act protected black Americans from discrimination but it didn't include disabled people. It wasn't until the 90s that the Americans with Disabilities Act was enacted. <clears throat> we have sustained a long history of not having whole human rights. And I think it's important to just take a quick tracing through historical bodies, historical disabled bodies. There was a time, has anyone heard of the Salem witch trials? When disabled bodies or mental illness were tortured, burned, killed. Has anyone heard of the ugly laws? They're real. The first ugly law was put into effect 
in the 1840s in San Francisco. And it literally said that the unsightly bodies could be arrested and disappeared from society. It wasn't until 1979 that the last ugly law was actually repealed. We then went through an era with P.T. Barnum and others who were profiteers of the disabled body, putting the disabled body on stages as freaks for the enjoyment of the non-disabled community and the wealthy. I mean, think about that for a minute. Eugenics and sterilization. I mean, perfecting the human body, right? But part of that perfection plan was the forced sterilization of institutionalized, mentally ill, and disabled people. These are the states in our country that took part in forced sterilization plans. We don't do this anymore. The emergence of <clears throat> excuse me, disability civil rights, like I said, was, I mean, the skies parted and the sun came through. We became whole. That was with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then out of that came, <clears throat> excuse me, the IDEA, which gave school-age kids the protections of a free and appropriate public education. They could have an education plan that met them where they were. This was a celebration. We still have a long way to go, though. But then something happened. Charity. Still that otherness. Non-disabled people can feel good about giving money to that other person. That's separate, otherized. <clears throat> and then in the 90s, with the ad advances in technology, which are fantastic, we started to see posters and inspirational photos that said, hey, if you're disabled, you can overcome it. And also, it became inspiration for non-disabled people to say, hey, if that little girl can run, then I can sure get off the sofa and start running and exercising too. Still, keeping the disabled body separate and otherize, not connecting, not relating, not including diverse bodies. And here's where we are today. I call it the era of inclusion and equity. It's a performance of inclusion, right? I mean, it's on the right track. Corporate social responsibility boxes are checked when corporations engage in social good. But what about the value of inclusion? What about not excluding in the first place? Do we have a plan for that? It's a real question. I'd like to introduce you to an epic fail in the performance of inclusion by one of our most notable toy manufacturers, Mattel. Mattel is the creator of 
the ideal Barbie. And Barbie has her ideal motorhome and her Corvette and her house and so on and so forth. The fantasy world. But Mattel wanted to get in on the inclusion conversation. So Mattel created Becky, Barbie's disabled friend. Now, the problem that Becky had is that Becky only fit in Barbie's kitchen. <laughs> Becky couldn't go down the stairs. Becky didn't fit in the motorhome. She certainly couldn't ride in the Corvette. And Becky didn't even fit in Barbie's elevator. The doors weren't wide enough. Now, we know, because we've learned this today, that the social model of disability would tell us that it's the environment's problem, right? Right? Yes. But Mattel's designers didn't see it that way. They, rather than changing Barbie's world, flexing and bending to accommodate Becky, the designers discontinued Becky. <laughs> and they repurposed Becky as all smiles Becky, Barbie's photographer. It's a true story. This is so allegorical <laughs> of our current state of disability othering, ableism, just not engaging or acknowledging diverse human bodies. So, I don't know. I have a few things to say about that, and I wrote them down. And I'm just going to exclaim them right now. We, disabled people, do not want to live in the shadows. We, disabled people, refuse shame directed at us as a result of our bodily diversity. We, disabled people, will not be silenced. Silenced by idealistic policies, bureaucracies, and laws that simply and cannot do, cannot apply to all. We, disabled people, want an accessible, built environment to have access to and navigate spaces workplaces, schools, doctor's offices, and more, where our bodies are today mostly unwelcome. We, disabled people, want clothes made for our unique shapes and sizes. We, disabled people, want media, news, television, film, print, media, and more to accurately represent the disabled experience, media that is directly informed by us, media that makes us visible, media that hires actual disabled actors. We, disabled people, want relationships that are about interdependence with non-disabled and disabled people. We want relationships that bend. We, disabled people, resist the notion that disability is some exception to a normalized body and reject the otherness. We reject the narratives of less than human or better off dead than disabled. Sympathy, charity, overcoming our disabilities to the delight and relief 
of non-disabled people. And we, disabled people, insist on agency. We insist upon being fully realized human beings. Some of you may be wondering if I ever went back to that job. I didn't because I get letters from people from across our country and around the world who say, thank you for creating a space that I can now direct my family to, that they can learn about my invisible disability. Or a woman, I'll never forget, from the Midwest who wrote me and said, your community is the only community where I feel like I belong, where I feel solidarity. Or when I get a letter about our This Is Me platform and someone says to me, thank you for allowing me to tell my story on a video camera so that I can disrupt the silence around the invisibility that I feel. This is my life's work. This, I hope, will be part of your work now, too, and your understanding. The last question that I, I still have, and it's the one that I want to leave you with today, it is, who gets to be fully realized human being with unfettered access to the world, materially, socially, and culturally. And it's up to us to decide that. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your presentation. Um, we have time for a couple questions, and I have a microphone. Um, if you could wait until the microphone gets to you to ask your question, that will help everybody hear what you have to say. Um, and we'll start with a question in the center of the auditorium. Thank you for your presentation. I um, appreciate what you're doing and the attention you're drawing to this. I think most of the people in this audience can relate better than many audiences to this because when you become older, when you retire, you become invisible. And I want to make sure that you're aware of that so that we are included in your thoughts when you present this because that means that every person on this earth is going to become invisible and that it behooves them to start paying attention to it now because the houses they build with large stairwells are not going to allow their parents to go up them. They're not going to allow them to go up it if they break their leg and that we continue to act as if everyone can climb stairs. And more importantly, I think that the shame that is in, has become part of the conversation didn't allow President Roosevelt to be seen in his wheelchair. It doesn't allow people in the military who want to stay and advance to seek counseling for their PTSD. It doesn't allow people in employment to admit that they need a break and instead, they're going to have a problem on the workforce that can be disastrous for everyone. And so by making sure that people understand that everyone either has a disability or is susceptible to having one suddenly come into their life if they get cancer, if they find that their walker 
at age 30 that they need for whatever temporary reason won't allow them to get into their bathroom. Right. That this is a conversation that goes from birth to death that everyone needs to pay attention to. And drawing that attention to this is vitally important and I thank you for doing so. Thank you, that is so, yeah. That really is so well said. And, you know, we say our bodies are constantly evolving and sometimes changing minute by minute. Um, and you're right. Whether we're young or old, age is also part of that intersectional identity. And, um, and thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for your comment. And we have another question on this side of the auditorium. I was jumping out of my seat listening to your stories about your son in school. I have just retired after 30 years of an e being an English second language teacher and I sat every week on a student study team mixed with all the specialists in the school. And I find what happened outrageous. And so my question is, did you ever go back to the school and talk with them about any of this that happened? Because it seems the person that was working with your child needed to be straightened out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Um, you bet I went back. And, uh, you know, it, it was a long, you know, we're, we're really engaging with, with a system of hyper-competitive. They want all students to be the next, you know, Ivy League candidate, et cetera. And, and when an autistic student presents as a little different, you know, they tend to see it as a disciplinary problem rather than just having a diverse student. Um, unfortunately, this particular district was not interested in any way to change or bend or be flexible. So I took my son out of that district. And so he's doing fantastic now, I'm very happy to say. And we have time for one more question or comment, if somebody has a question or comment in the back. Oh, if you could um, wait for the mic, that way everybody could hear. Yeah. You'll have to tell me. I was curious if, if there's any country that you feel that has a much more egalitarian attitude mm. towards invisible disabilities. That, that, are we, an, is the United States one of the worst? Is it unusual or is it just, you know, they're all like. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I, There are, there are some countries that are, that are doing better. For example, Australia has a very um, large disability conversation happening. And I, I do see a lot of progress in that country. Um, but this is an excellent point, is that, you know, disabled bodies are treated far worse in other places, and in some places, a little better. Um, but, you know, I, I know, for example, yeah, so there are, I, I won't go into it, but there are certain um, countries that are doing a little bit better. But, you know, you have to take it all into, into a context of better how, I mean, as measured by what. Um, you know, they might have, you know, more social acceptance, but maybe, the education isn't as competitive or, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a push-pull. There, there's no perfect model out there right now, to my knowledge. Um, thank you again, Linda, for your presentation and thank you to those of you who came today. Hopefully yes. um, you, you found this interesting and if any of you would like to share this, we will be posting it to the museum's YouTube channel. So please revisit it, share it, and also take some time to visit the object stories um, exhibition just outside of this room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.